Welcome to E-Commerce Australia podcast. Today's outstanding guest on the show has recently become a founder of her own business called Journey Flow. After spending the last 15 years in e-commerce, working for some incredible brands such as The Body Shop, The Paz Group, which is now Brand Collective, Bot and Gun and TXO by Tiffany Hall. Big welcome to the e-commerce podcast, Sasha Murray. Thanks so much for having me, Ryan. Uh, looking for looking forward to, to chatting to you, um, people that are listening to this podcast and, and e-commerce experts and, and business owners in general probably hear how much the, the customer journey we talk about is a huge issue and a, and a huge area of um, you know improvement for a lot of brands. Uh, I'm really keen to get into how um, journey flow started from you and your background more generally. So um, yeah, looking forward to this one. So maybe just touch on your background before journey flow started when about six months ago um not even i launched probably really um about six weeks ago okay i six suppose weeks. beautiful yeah. <laughs> so we're pretty new yep pretty yeah nice new. um what what made that come about like you've obviously spent you've obviously got a, a great background from those brands that i mentioned and you've been working kind of brand side for you know the last 15 years i think it was so um yep. Did you see a, a need or working for those brands, like was customer journey always a passion of you that you wanted to now um, come out and, and sort of deliver that service for other brands? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's growing so much, my passion for the customer side uh, of e-commerce. Um, so when I sort of started out fresh out of uni, um, my first gig was in health software, actually, and back when my era, I suppose we can say, when <laughs> I went to uni, there wasn't any subjects at all um, on digital. So going into my first role, I was interested in a straight marketing role, but it was for health software company. And that's where the e-commerce kind of kicked off because I um, got thrown in the deep end. Um, and back then it was, you know, EDMs were kind of new, but it was learning how to code them in Dreamweaver, if you remember right. Dreamweaver. <laughs> <laughs> um, and working with the amazing software guys who sort of taught me some fundamentals and principles of coding and that kind of thing. So I sort of, um, fell into it that way. So I, I spent about six years with them. Um, then moving on to the body shop, which was pretty exciting enough to being in something as not as fun, I suppose, <laughs> yeah. as you can say with health software. Um, so working out yeah, with the body shop and moving on to review and Metallica's clothing, um, over at Paz Group. But I think the customer-centric approach really got ingrained in me when I was working with Rod and Gun. Okay. And I was there for quite a long time. Um, and the CEO there, Mike, he has always been so focused on the customer and that the customer is number one. They're the center of the universe. And so everything we did, we always put the customer first. And it okay. didn't matter what initiative we were looking at, but it was like, well, let's make everything easy for the customer. What's going to help us get the right customer? How are we going to continue to look after our loyal customer? Everything was so focused around the customer there. So when I went through the whole journey, journey of Rod and Gun, which was huge, um, and I was there for about six years and we did lots of amazing things, the passion that I really came out of that with was making shopping experiences seamless and easy for the customer and enjoyable for the customer from end to end, from when you arrive on the website to when your package arrives at your house to when you need to go into store to um, make an exchange or a return. Just looking at every every element along the digital path and how can you make that as seamless and easy as possible? Yeah, yeah, interesting. I think sometimes as e-commerce business owners and uh and brands yes. you know sometimes when you make the yes. sale yeah. you, you that you know some brands yes. probably yeah. look at that uh, even unconsciously is that yeah. sort of the end point yeah. they've made that sale but it, in fact it's just the start really um of that of that customer journey uh, as you touched on yeah exactly it's it's full circle and you know you really want the brands to be able to make sure that they're getting that that customer back and that they're retaining them and that the experience doesn't get so frustrating that they either don't come back to purchase again or you don't convert them when you've spent all of that investment and that time and energy to get them to your side in the first place. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. How do you know if your business has a customer journey problem? Um, I feel there's a few different ways. None of them are 
super clear and as, <laughs> as much as you would hope. But the first one is tra traditional feedback. So your customers, majority of the time, are going to tell you if there's a fundamental issue and they'll custom contact you through, um, you know, customer service or live chat. Um, I've got an example of shopping on um, a, a website about six weeks ago and I was looking for a dress and on the website, the dress sizes were in extra small, small, medium, large, extra large. And I was on my mobile and went to the size guide to try and figure out what size I was. But the size guide measurements were able to a size, you know, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. So All right. I'm thinking not only is like, that's frustrating, sure, that's frustrating, but in my mind, I'm like, oh my gosh, such a simple thing. How are they losing so much? They'll be losing so much money um, from not having the size guide size guide directly matched to their product, right? Yeah. So I I contacted them through live chat because I can't help myself. I need to talk to these <laughs> yeah. things. And um, the lovely person I was talking to on live chat sent me a screenshot of the size guide and what it should look like, um, which is what they actually have on their desktop site. And I just said, you guys need to update that on mobile because you're probably losing so many sales off the back of that. And I'm sorry to say that they still haven't updated it yet. So I'm thinking just in this last six weeks, you know, how much revenue have they lost just because people can't figure out what size they are across their whole women's clothing range? Um, so sometimes it can be the smallest things that make the biggest difference. But in that example, the customers, you know, in some cases, uh, not all, but they'll they'll communicate that with you. So you need to make sure that you've got that relationship with your customer service teams and your social teams, that that feedback avenue is there to make sure that you're making the right updates and the customers are being heard and you're making the changes. Yeah. Um, Interesting. The other that, one. That could sorry. be a good, that could be a good BD tool for you as well. Right. So, you know, you're almost forced to have to do more online shopping just, yeah. just so you can see the, the user, the customer journey. So, um, Claimable, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would like seriously get in contact with the CEO of that business and, uh, yeah. and, and, and hit them up. It's obviously a genuine problem and. And there, there seems to be a bit of a misalignment then with the, either the customer service team not telling the, the e-com team or telling them and not getting a response. So Exactly. Um, yeah, Communication. Great, great BD tool. Sorry, to right. cut you off. Um, <laughs> yeah, the second one is you, you've got your traditional key metrics, right? So you, you've got your conversion rate, your confer conversion funnel, um, average order value, your bounce rates, your exit rates. All can give you an indication if there is a potential issue. But as most e-commerce and digital managers would know, analyzing all of that information, unless there's a core fundamental issue that you might have, for example, on your checkout and those numbers really stand out, you're analyzing those metrics against, you know, this day last week, um, month on month year on year what happened on those days did you send an email out last year but you didn't miss you did you have a promo running last year but you didn't miss you um so it's not it doesn't shine through in a lot of the cases um because they can fluctuate so much depending on what you've been doing as a brand yeah um but they can give you an indication so i really do believe that if you've got the time and the capacity and bandwidth in your team to, you've got to put yourself in your customer's shoes and go through the journeys yourself, because that really is the only way you'll identify sort of user friction issues from end to end. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, sometimes you can be so close to the brand that you just, you just know it. And so it's so hard to look at it fresh with a yep. fresh set of eyes without, you know, even with someone within the business, um, because you just, you just know so much more than, than the average customer who's just looking for a product that you sell. That's um, completely right. And yeah, you, I think, yeah, I what, sorry, sorry, you go. I was going to say, you've got to overlay it too with a shopping intention. Wow. So it's all very well just to go, go through the funnel and, you know, do some test orders and everything, but brainstorm some actual shopping intentions. I'm a mom searching for, you know, boys shorts in a size three and go through that, go through that whole journey and come up with a whole lot of them and do it constantly because that's when you'll actually find most of the issues when you're really searching for something. Yeah. It's a good tip to be really specific around that. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a good tip. I also, um, before we move on to the next question, 
I, I seen a post and I, I just uh, commented on it just before we started here, but um, you made a, a recent post on LinkedIn around the delay in communication. I think, I can't remember, you didn't mention the brand, obviously, but um, you had a, a gift that you were trying to purchase. You had four days before that event uh, was yeah. due. You signed up, made the purchase. There was nothing to uh, write on the as a gift. So yeah. there was no sort of gifting solution. And then you got emailed 24 hours later saying they didn't have the product in stock, even though it was available to buy on the website. Um, how did you end up handling that? I've seen that there was a few comments around, I, I was in the camp that I wouldn't shop there again because it's okay. 2024. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, there were some people that, that were very nice and saying, oh, you've got to email the, the company and let them know. But I feel like that's such an e-commerce uh, professional thing to do. Yeah. Um, how did you end up handling that? I, um, well, I emailed them back and said, you know, I, I can see that the product's now available again on your website as of today, you know, so why is that? I was keen to know, you know, from their perspective, are they, are they aware, or, you know, have they oversold that item 50 times and 50 of their customers have got that email today saying, sorry, but it don't have it anymore. And they acknowledge that there's, um, there's a delay in their stock adjusting on and a significant lag and it's something that they're working on but you know and she said all the right things that like let me help you try and find it again but to be honest I actually abandoned that because it was too late for it to get there in time so I shopped elsewhere but funnily enough yeah. that I know I'll shop with that brand again because I shop with them so frequently that's not enough to turn me off but I'm not sure if that's because I empathize because I, I know what it can be like if things, you know, aren't perfect in the e-com, e-com land, but other customers may not be the same. Yeah, yeah. I, was a, yeah. More pr- I was a bit more, my comment was a bit more brutal than yours by the sounds of it, but um, I actually, I had, uh, and this is more of a retail discussion, but I went into, uh, should I name them? I won't name them, um, but I went into a, uh, um, a hair uh product retailer uh, which is quite well known in Chadston the other day and I was waiting there for eight minutes to check out uh, and no one acknowledged me no one served me so I just left the product in <laughs> I put the product back on the shelf and and walked out so um, they definitely need some help with their customer journey both online and, and in retail stores as well so um, yeah it's brutal but that's the way it goes um, how, how has the user expectation shifted over the year uh, that you've seen? Obviously, you've spent 15 years in, in e-commerce. Um, you know, where, where do you think the user expectation has shifted to and where's it going? Yeah, so I hate to mention the C word, but COVID happened, right? <laughs> so, um, I felt like that was a really big shift. You know, shoppers that weren't necessarily online shoppers became online shoppers. Um, but now time has passed and I feel like those online shoppers have now become more, they're more savvy shoppers. Um, we've got the Gen Zs of the world who are coming through and their digital first culture, um, coupled with the millennials. I actually saw a stat the other day and it was a bit mind blowing. It was by 2029, Gen Z and millennials are going to make up 79% of the global workforce. Jeez. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, which not is crazy, bit, not, right? Not, not, I'm done. <laughs> which just goes to show, like, devices are key and everyone's going to be shopping online more and more and more, but our expectations have shifted, like, especially with Gen Zs and millennials. You know, we, we know what good looks like as far as the shopping experience goes. I feel like during COVID, people were, you know, just excited to get a parcel delivered to their door. And that was like the highlight of the day, if not the week. So I yeah. think we were more lenient because that was our only means of getting something. So there was a lot more patience, I believe. But I think there's just such a, a huge shift now that people don't have time to waste on frustrating shopping experiences. You know, we, we're we busy and we just want things to be seamless and happen. And we want to have the communication because we're used to that now. And so I think it's only going to keep increasing and increasing um, the longer time goes on. And there was another, um, interesting stat I saw by, um, PwC, which was 86% of shoppers are prepared to pay more for a better shopping experience. So, yeah, that's a lot. It is a lot. And that really shocked me too. And it's like, people are happy to pay more and then they care more about the experience than an extra few dollars potentially in their transaction. 
Yeah. yeah. I think to, to like, as brands become much better at doing, I always think it's like those little one percenters that, that add up to like 3%, 4%, 6%. Um, when it comes to that, that last touch point in communication or that, that one extra text or email, um, letting them know where the, what the product is or live tracking of their deliveries, little one percenters that add up over time. If you're not keeping up with that trend, then you actually, your business looks a lot worse because they might be shopping on a few different websites and ordering a few different things. And if you're the only brand that's not communicating to a certain standard, then you're left behind and perhaps you're not even aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I do feel like people are becoming less loyal now as well. And then there's the whole conversation around um, ethics and sustainability, which plays a part too. And especially with Gen Zs. Um, if you don't align to the, the values plays a part too now, if you're not aligning to those values, your customer experience could be great too, but Gen Z's are more likely to abandon and, and not shop with you again, just based on that moral factor as well. So it's just not as simple these days as, you know, as making sure there's no friction points across your website and your journey. Um, the brands have to stand, stand for a lot. So it's interesting. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, what does it mean commercially to your business if you have a customer journey issue? It's probably varied is an answer, but yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, I feel like you're losing a lot and you're losing a lot across the board. Um, you're losing your current loyal customers, your new customers that you're spending a whole lot of money on in acquisition to get them to the website in the first place. Um, your market share, obviously, if you're not doing it well, but just like we said, someone else will, will jump in and take your customer pretty easily and your brand reputation can get damaged. Like word of mouth is so strong. When I was, um, starting Journey Flow and I was floating the idea of family and friends and peers, it was amazing. Everyone straight away would come back and say, perfect. Can you work with this brand, this brand, this brand? Cause they're so frustrating, you know? Yeah. So people are they do talk about it. So the brand reputation um, can be impacted too if when you've got those sorts of issues. So at the end of the day, it really, it's revenue and profit, which you're losing out on, which is, I mean, that's why what we're all working towards. Um, that's pretty much like the oxygen. <laughs> the oxygen of what we do. But, you know, when you think about just slight improvements that can be made, so if you can slightly shift the, the needle on your um, conversion rate, your average order value and your card abandonment rate and think about what that does if you make a few minor adjustments to improve your journey. It's to, it's a compounding effect, right? So it's, you know, day on day, week on week, year on year, and that revenue is compounding and compounding. And they can, they can turn into hundreds of thousands of dollars a year like when you, when you add it up. So I feel like for an investment in time or money for a, an outsourced audit, it's um it's completely worthwhile because you can really ship the needle um and look after that revenue and profit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think too with um like always improving that. So you're up against you know, and one of the biggest issues in e-commerce in Australia at the moment is obviously how do you combat the likes of Timu? Um, they have pretty good UX. Um, yeah, you know, or you, you could probably tell me, but they do seem to have a quite a, a you know they they spend a lot of money in data. And, uh, and user experience, and it's pretty seamless. So uh, if you're wanting to compete and you're obviously not competing on price, you're going to be needing to compete on customer journey, um, you know, community ethics, morals, you know, yeah. as, as you sort of touched on. So, um, you know, that, that adds another layer to it as well. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And they kind of, I feel like they've kind of followed the simplicity of the Amazon experience, you know? Yeah, 100%. So like really nailing that customer journey and... Um, the no frills approach, just everything just works. Yeah. 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 <laughs> do, do you have a benchmark statistic or, or like if, if businesses are looking at their card abandonment rate, do you have a, a standard sort of benchmark where you're like, yep, that's good. No, that's, that's something that you need to look at. Like from your experience. Yeah. Card abandonment usually sits between 70, 80%, which is so yep. high, right? They just think of yeah. Like, how many customers that actually translates to. Um, Almost, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. So, you know, I feel like if even if you're at 75 and above, you know, you That's... really need to be digging into why. 
Yeah. yeah. And how would they look at that? Like, I mean, sorry, not how would they look at that in terms of insights and, and analytics, but how would they ask those questions? Is that where something like an exit intent survey would come in handy? Is that where someone like yourself who comes in and, and sort of has a look at their customer journey and can highlight some of those issues or how, how would they combat that? Yeah, definitely. I think um, sort of looking at your bounce and exit rates across your pages down at a, at a page level can give you a lot of insight as well. So, um, you know, if you have got crazy exit rates on your PDP pages, it's like, well, what aren't you doing on your PDP pages? You know, it, for example, like we were talking about before is your size guide completely wrong? Are you putting the wrong information sort of too, um, too far high on your page or too low or um, really breaking it down and using those metrics to dig into it um, a lot deeper? Or alternatively, exactly that, do an audit um, if you've got the capacity to um, be able to outsource that to, to do the digging um, as well. There's also another good tool can be your web session recordings as okay. well. I feel like they're really underutilized. Um, they're just to be able to sit there and watch exactly how your customer is interacting um, with your site is invaluable. So, and you can sort of see perhaps where those issues are. Um, so, you know, a good option could be to like build it into your team's KPIs for the week. Everyone watches 10 web session recordings. Can you find any insights in those recordings of why? customers are abandoning and what pages they're abandoning on could be a really good good tool as well yeah that's uh that's a great tip actually yeah um definitely it's uh yeah and if, if you just do that you know 10 times a week yeah. i don't know what take you half an hour maybe yeah, exactly. um depends how long it is but uh if, if you know everyone does 10 then yeah. it's uh i'm sure you get some pretty good insights out of that yeah what um what are the the top have you got like a top three tips for businesses to to look at um, for their own customer journeys. Obviously, um, we'll get into uh, how you can help clients and, and customers um, if they wanted to hire yourself. Top top three tips generally for businesses who are um, to help them with their own customer journeys and some, some typical pain points that you see and some solutions for those. Yeah, I sort of touched on it a bit earlier, the making sure you've got that loop of communication with your customer service team your social teams and your live chat teams. Um, it can be something as simple as like a shared Google Doc. Um, if you've got a Zendesk um, integration, make sure that you've got a flag set up that directly communicates to your team if there's something to dive into. So it's making sure that you're really actioning that customer feedback. I think that is super important. Um, test your call nice. purchase functions is probably the other one. Your fundamentals. Um so they would be your search, you know, making sure you're checking your search terms, looking for your search terms that people are searching but are getting zero results for. Because yes. those people, they've got such a high purchase intent. Um, and if there's no results coming up or poor results coming up, um, that's a huge gap, a huge opportunity just there in itself. It's a good um, one, actually, yeah. So, like, just making sure that all your products are tagged and, and um, you know, uh, recorded accurately so that search bar works um, 100% of the time. Yeah. Um, you know, if you put a new product drop coming in, for example, some of those products that you're pushing out to the website, test them, make sure, um, you know, results are being shown. Uh, you'll find a few little goodies in there, I'm sure, to optimize your search. Um, the other one is filters. Filters Filters is one of the fr most frustrating parts for me, but such a core feature of when you're shopping online. Um, and the amount of filters that are broken is crazy. So if you're testing and, and especially aligned to those product drops as well, if you've got new products coming onto your site, um, check your filters, check that all of that enriching information that's coming down from your PIM is filtering through and they're working. Um, and I feel like that, that can be often forgotten that everyone just expects that they'll just, you know, work seamlessly, but I can guarantee you every website out there is a currently sitting there with an issue with their filters. Oh, that's a great, great tip. And yeah, it's yeah. something that hasn't come up before, but it's such a, um, you know, you, you bang on with that. So um, filters, yeah, that's yeah. that's really, really good. And so on that, like, you know, as an example, on the collection page, being able to filter by size and by color and making sure that all the right products turn up exactly. and that you're not missing any. Yep. 
Yeah, but also um, the way your filters are exposed. So if you've got size ranges, like I had the other one day, sorry, one the other day, um, searching for boys shorts in size two, right? So it had sizes one to two as a filter, size two, size two to three, but you couldn't select all those filters at the same time. Right. So you had to filter one, scan through the product, filter on the next one, scan through the product, filter on the next one, because they're all possibilities, right? So that they don't don't work. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Concurrently, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes other. sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Interesting. And what yeah. what was that website yeah, built on? Was that a Shopify build? That was not. Okay. No. Yeah. No. That might be the issue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shopify makes it pretty easy. Exactly. Some do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I feel like a lot of issues can come if you've got um, like a, a PIM that sits in between potentially. Um, yeah. Okay. But another one would be, yeah, the size guides. I know we've already mentioned that a little bit, but um, test your size guides. Even if you're searching for a particular product, the amount of size guides that will pop up that are completely unrelated to that category. Hmm. You know, so if you're searching for a woman's jumper and men's pants size guide pops up, but that. That can have a lot of, and a lot of this is just manual checking, right? Like you can't run a program to find these, um, sort of nuances. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true though. It's just in a world that's so competitive now, and we were talking before we recorded around, you know, brands spending so much money on Google ads and Facebook ads and, and paid acquisition is so high to not do those one percenters. It's actually, yeah, quite, quite expensive if you don't look at things like size guides or yeah, just, just how people actually shop as opposed shop. to yeah. what we think, you know, click on the ad, visit the product and then check out. Like there's just so much more when we're dealing with human behavior, I guess. Yes, it's so true. And when we were chatting and, um, I mentioned that I had a coffee with, um, a peer last week who's in the media space and she referred to it as uh, a leaky bucket. And I, that really stuck with me that term because like that's exactly what a website can be. It can be a leaky bucket. And, you know, brands are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, if not millions of dollars on customer acquisition strategies and marketing to then drive people to the website. And these core functions, for the shopping functions, aren't working seamlessly. It's, you know, we've got to plug the bucket, <laughs> fill the bucket yeah, up. Yeah, No, 100%. I think it's yeah. an analogy that everyone can relate to. Exactly. Um, so, a um, couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, what are what are the common questions that you get um, when you're talking to prospective clients who are looking to sort of go with your business, even though it is only you know six weeks old, um, you know, but you've been in the industry for such a long period of time and got such experience. Yeah. Are there some common questions that you're getting when people are um, wanting to uh, look at look at your services? Yeah, um, the main one is really around how long does an order take. Okay. Um, yeah, for me. So it does take a while because um, the way I like to operate is, you know, brainstorm, look at the brand, um, come up with a whole array of user flows that encompass all of your potential user journeys across your brand. And then I like to overlay those with actual purchase intent scenarios. So and go from that flow from landing on the website all the way through to um, picking up in store, for example, if it's a click and collect or waiting for the delivery to you know, arrive at my house, then go and exchange it in store. So I like to do the full end to end because it doesn't just, customer journey just doesn't end, you know, when the parcel arrives at your house. And, you know, the one of the biggest bugbears for people as well, which we haven't really spoken about yet, is, you know, the returns process. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, you might get a piece of paper in your parcel and um, it's like, oh, okay, great. Well, I've got to print out my label. So you know, I've got to get a printer or go to wherever I can print something like office works because not many people have printers anymore. Stick it onto my parcel. So it's so clunky, you know, and, but you've got like loops and refunders of the world today. So it's like, how can that be improved as well? So I like to do the full the full circle um, for the customer experience end to end. So it does take a it does take a while, but I feel like there's no other way unless it's um, sort of boots on the ground to get them those insights. Um, yeah, especially overlay just with my e-commerce background. Um, so I'm still looking at it through the e-commerce lens as well. Um, yeah, 
So Aside what's a from, sorry. what's a typical audit length then uh, so for those no, that oh, are wondering? <laughs> <laughs> the key point um, yeah. about four to about four weeks, four to six okay. weeks, because yep. I like to document everything along the way, um, and then all that documentation can go to the brand and, and they can look at each of the journeys in full and see what all the steps were and where the friction points were, and not just friction points but also areas of opportunity. So what's not there, you know, what's not there that could work really well. So it's not necessarily just trying to find problems, but it's also a lot of opportunity. For example, like what we were talking about before, that um, that particular brand didn't have a gift messaging section in their checkout. Um, and there can be reasons why that they may not have that, but there are solutions to those problems too. So yeah, opportunities okay. as well. Yeah, yeah, nice. And then yeah. so at the end of that four to six weeks, yeah. You you present um, your your findings in a in a in a document that they can then sort of hand on to it, whoever they need to in the business and and show that the findings of it and the action points and the implementations of those. That, so it's a, a live document that they can um, then action and um, and continue to add to it and, and grow that's uh, right. as they do. And then would you suggest that um, they do this periodically? Like is it a and um, with they using your services, is it, is it just a one-off project fee or it, or do you do retain the model or what, what's the, how do you sort of generally like to work with businesses? Yeah, well, businesses can take the methodology um, and then put it into practice themselves as well. So um, to have, it'd be really good to do sort of another, a six month check-in um, with the brand. I feel like that could be beneficial sort of from the initial order, what changes have you made? Um, and then, you know, obviously measure the improvements um, from those changes. And then to maybe do a, a check-in in six months and, and it wouldn't be as, um, wouldn't have to be as granular, I think, but yep. I'm sure right, review exactly um, to the improvements in the in the flows and, and other potential opportunities, or there might be opportunities that I've recommended um, that they haven't necessarily got to yet. So it could be fleshing those out more. So I like to provide um, and break it down a little bit of the areas of friction points and the low hanging fruit. So what are you, what are your quick wins? And then what shakes out of that is also, is there a need for um, potential partners, um, new partners or solutions or technology or dev updates that need to be put in place or um, investigated further um, to help those gaps that we found during the audit as well. So we've got the audit and then there could be potential potential to help the brands um, with the solutions to those problems yeah. as well. Yeah, beautiful. I yeah. think it, uh, it makes sense to, you know, get in contact and, and do a four to six week kind of audit um, that could save you uh, a lot of money um, if you haven't got the time or um, if you just need a fresh fresh set of eyes on that with your, your background and experience. Um, last question on your business um, pricing wise. Uh, I don't know if you've got a, a, an exact price or, or how the pricing works, but is it more suited to enterprise level, medium sized businesses, or can small businesses also get involved? Um, I would say probably more medium to enterprise, but yep. I'm always happy to talk with small with small businesses and and help them in any way I can. Um, there might be a smaller portion, uh, or maybe potentially not as much time required. Um, so I'm happy to chat with all size businesses. There's always benefits that can that can be made yeah exactly and i feel like uh you know in the e-com yeah, industry and yeah, retail yeah. we're all pretty generous yeah. with our with our yeah. time and information i found that um at retail fest as well yeah. Yeah. and even yeah. on the, this podcast people are really happy so um you know if you're a small business and wanting some some advice then yeah get in yeah. touch with sasha either on linkedin or yeah. um or via yeah. By her website, which I'll put in the show notes, and um, and then yeah, I get, have have a conversation and see where it land, where it leads to. Absolutely, sounds good. Love um, to chat. What, one more question. Yeah. Uh, I probably should have asked this before uh, going into to your business, but um, have you got any examples yes, yeah. of e-commerce businesses that you love um, shopping with or you look to for best practice? Are there any hero brands that our our audience can kind of jump on and um, you know, experience that for themselves. I, I was on uh, Culture Culture King uh, website the other day, and I found that quite good. Yeah, it was quite quite busy, um, which is not traditionally what I like in an e-commerce business. But 
Um, it was super clear on, you know, expectations, when I'll get my products, um, how much further I had to spend for free shipping and all that sort of thing. So it did tick a lot of boxes for me, but have you got any brands that you kind of look to as the, the hero in that sort of customer journey field? I do. And this one's a recent one um, that I was particularly impressed with, which is LSKD. Okay. I feel like they're doing it really well. It was, I'm in my first sorry, first purchase a couple of weeks ago and it was seamless. And exactly what you said, all the information was there. All of it made sense. They'd thought about um, the activities that you might want to wear the clothes for. So, you know, the shop by occasion, so to speak, um, all the size guides were on point. Um, all of the communication around the shipping and returns and delivery, it was all there. The checkout was seamless. Um, I found it to be really, really good. Um, aside from Lots. that, I love shopping on Amazon myself. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's so not, not particularly fashion related, but I feel like the convenience of it. So mm. the simplicity and convenience, and I usually just order household goods on there. Um, so, you know, your toilet paper and your washing powder and all that stuff that you can't be bothered lugging away from the supermarket. Um, it, coupled with your prime membership that you've got on TV, and the convenience of how fast it can get there, like nappies included, you know, you order it, free delivery, and it's there the next day. Like for me, that's like the the perfect journey. Yep. No frills on the website, clear, and the post post purchase communication and how fast they are to ship. I really really find that a useful one, and I still really love the iconic. Okay, I still feel like they're doing it really well. Yeah. You know? Their filters work pretty well. I know that. <laughs> yeah, they've got the filters. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So they're, they're three different businesses, obviously yeah. three different sizes, but, you know, Amazon may be a hard one to replicate for, for some of those smaller and medium sized businesses out there. But I think like anything, there are parts of it. If you observe what you like about, um, you know, whatever brands that, that anyone shops with and what you like about that and how you can add that to your store. Um, but I think it's just so important to get fresh set of eyes on that uh which is you know one of the reasons why i wanted to have you on um because it just seems to make like you can just be too close to your brand sometimes so yeah. i think the service that you've come up with is a really um great one it's a there's a genuine need out there for it um so yeah look appreciate you sharing your insights and your time um obviously so new on on your own business journey but uh yeah, hopefully if people are, are interested in listening to this podcast, they can um, they can get in touch with you and, and get an audit underway and you can save them a lot of money. <laughs> Do you want to say that again? Yes. Thank you so much for your time, Ryan. I really appreciate the opportunity. No problem. Yeah, it was uh, great to have you on and I'm looking forward to watching the business grow over the year. So uh, all the best with it. Thanks so much. Take care.